the considered exotic goods out east became the the cream of the luxury goods in the west and so the trick was to how do you how do you avoid those markups um, the solution was hit upon by the spanish and the portuguese who developed the technologies to sail farther from the sea excuse me farther from the shore with old coastal vessels if you happen to anchor which you had to do every night uh, within sight of land there is a reasonable chance that somebody who lived in the neighborhood was just going to come and take your ship and kill your people and take all your stuff uh, so that's one of the reasons why they tended to prefer the land routes uh, but with the portuguese and the spanish developing deep water navigation they were able to do an end run around that entire thing interface directly with the east and so from roughly uh, 1500 until roughly 1900 uh, the middle east just didn't matter it became a complete backwater uh, and eventually the western countries industrialized and when they came back to the middle east to an area that had not industrialized you know you bring a knife to a gunfight enough times and the locals pay attention and so you basically had the brits the french and the rest uh, divvy up the entire region into mandates and colonies now why was the west able to pull that off when the middle east just kind of stayed at the same technological level to be perfectly blunt the answer is rainfall uh, throughout the western countries uh, in europe it rains rain means that you can grow crops in any number of areas and that gives people an interest in pursuing their own economic destinies also you had winter in most of those areas so in the off season farmers could be working on something else uh, they weren't exactly getting law degrees but the point is the overall skill level of the population steadily creeped up and when you've got a lot of people who are vested in stability in the system even if it's not a democracy you get a degree of political stability economic advancement technological acumen that you just don't get in the middle east in the middle east very few places have rain where you do have water it's in a relatively narrow band either right on the coast or along a river and that makes it very very easy for a political authority to rise and dominate that specific geography and in doing so basically reduce the entire population to slave status uh, that does not give people a lot of interest in pursuing stability for the system it makes revolutionaries very popular but it also means that the power of the state is just almost total making it very very difficult for anyone to make something of themselves so you will get centers of learning throughout the middle east who did absolutely preserve the western knowledge during the dark ages but they never applied it themselves they never disseminated it within their own cultures they were basically just libraries maintained by monks oversimplification 1500 years of history i recognize that but you can't deny the economic trajectory of the middle east versus the west and then once the west cracked the code on industrial technologies and they started having gunpowder and cannon and the middle east was left behind there was no contest at all so now today the economies of the middle east matter more to the world today than they have for most of the last half millennia largely because of oil because there is an asset those that industrial economies need in order to function now this isn't so much an american problem directly because north america is self-sufficient well, not even self-sufficient in oil it's a significant exporter of oil uh, and if the middle east were to vanish tomorrow we'd have some adjustments on things like crude quality but within a couple of years we'd be totally fine however the europeans significantly less so specifically since the uh, russian crude is no longer part of their equation okay now where does that bring us well it means that anyone who goes into the middle east after about 1950 is faced in a very different environment from what was faced from you know 1000 AD to 1500 uh when it was just a place you had to push through or from 1500 until roughly 1950 when the west was industrialized but the middle east wasn't now the middle east is and you know no one's going to say that a group like isis in syria is like the pinnacle of human technology but it's really easy for them to get explosives and ak-47s so it's no longer a contest like we saw from 1900 to 1950 between an industrialized western imperial system and a completely non-industrialized almost tribal middle eastern system uh you've got a different makeup now now the governing systems of the middle east themselves are also in play and very much in flux because before 1950 you basically had a series of what could be best called fortress political systems where by dint of geography you know maybe they had an oasis like damascus maybe they were surrounded by desert like egypt maybe they were a mountain fastness like iran 
it's a little difficult to get in and out. And some of these areas are a lot more difficult to conquer than others, Iran probably being at the top of that list. But you introduce industrial technologies to this area in the post-colonial, post-World War II environment, and all of a sudden, they're not just drilling for oil, they're building roads. They're buying military hardware. And it makes for a di very different mix. You get this incredibly brittle, top-down, concentrated political system that is absolutely incapable of providing the people with a level of technological progress that is possible elsewhere in the world, because there's very little to work from aside from cash, from oil. And you apply that in a world where society is weak. Uh, well, and the result, you get lots and lots and lots and lots of militant groups. And if you want to back one versus the other or one versus government, that's fine. But even if you win and the militant group overthrows the government, well, then what? You've taken what little order exists in an area and it's turned into chaos. You get complete societal breakdown, as we've seen in places like Egypt and Iraq and Syria in recent years. So, enter the United States. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, the Bush administration felt that the best way to fight Al-Qaeda was to make sure that the countries that allowed Al-Qaeda to function would go after it. So after the Afghan operation, we discovered that Al-Qaeda scattered to the winds, and we found out that a lot of the recruits were coming from Syria, because that was how the Syrians got rid of their own dissidents. A lot of the troops, Taliban troops that were in Afghanistan, fled through Iran to parts unknown, because the Iranians were like, well, we would hate these guys, but we don't want to deal with them, especially since they don't like the Americans very much. And then the Saudis, not necessarily the government itself, but a lot of elements within Saudi Arabia were part of the ideological and financial underpinning that made Al-Qaeda possible. How do I know that? Because we allied with them back in the 80s to form the Mujahideen, which eventually became the Taliban. Anyway, so the U.S. is looking at this region, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. We're like, well, conquering any of them wouldn't be fun. Conquering all three at the same time, who to get after a militant group just doesn't seem like the right task. And so the solution that was struck upon was to knock over Iraq and occupy it with armored tank brigades, which is not the way you pacify a population. You want ground infantry for that. The idea is Tehran and Damascus and Riyadh, none of them thought the U.S. was going to do this. And so when it did it with tanks and left the tanks there, they're like, shit, there's nothing to stop the United States from turning on us. And while Iran was to a degree protected by its mountains and had a little bit more confidence and would be able to put up a good fight, the other two had no such confidence. And they knew that if the United States decided to come for them, that their regimes were done. Because there was no civil support. There was no technical competence. There was no cohesion. Well, it worked. And those three, three countries went after Al-Qaeda for us. And are the primary reasons, the strategy is the primary reason, why Al-Qaeda is for all intents and purposes no more. The problem is that we didn't declare victory and went home. We tried to make Iraq look like Wisconsin with the results that you can imagine, because again, there's nothing to build from in terms of society. We overthrew what stable order there was and replaced it with nothing. Now, fast forward to today. Uh, the W. Bush administration felt they had no choice but to go in. And, you know, we can debate whether it worked out well or not. First phase of the plan, I think, worked. Second phase, Obama changed nothing, despite his rhetoric. Trump said he pulled out, but left troops in places like Syria to fight ISIS because no one, no one in the U.S. political system wants to be blamed for being the guy who allowed that militant group to come back. But here's the problem. The countries in these areas are never going to have the foundation that's necessary to form a country in the way that Americans or Westerners in general, or even Asians, see it. And so if your goal is to prevent the creation or the operation or the resurgence of a specific type of militancy, you will be there forever. And that's one of the reasons why we call them the forever wars, because we found ourselves going to war with a military tactic as opposed to any specific group. And while most of our troops are out of the region now, what happened uh, earlier today in Syria is the best that we can hope for unless the strategy changes. We are never going to be able to turn these countries into something that we would normally recognize as a peer or as even someone in the same category as the nation states 
that we have in most of the rest of the world. That's not how these areas work. They never have. They don't have the economic geography to try. And so we're left with a fun little discussion we have to have. Option A is stick it out forever. Do what most of our forces have been doing in the region uh, since the operation was slimmed down under Trump and hunker in your bases and watch. And if something like al ISIS bubbles up again, hit it with a hammer, go back to your bases and watch some more. And if you do that, you'll be there forever. And while you're there forever, other militant groups who have their own ideas of who should be in charge will take pot shots at you. And that's what we've been seeing uh, with the Iranians being the instigators. This is the new normal. This is the old normal. This is just what the region looked like. Option two, leave. From a casualty point of view, it's easy. Uh, we're never going to make this area look like something that we want. Ready there. Let's talk about the Mexicans. This is a uh, population density map. The deep red, those are the urban cores. The yellow are small towns and suburbs. And if you look north of the border, that pattern, dense urban cores, suburbs, small towns, as a geographer, that tells me that it rains. Rain makes farms, farms make small towns, small towns make suburbs, suburbs make inner cities. South of the border, you don't have that because it's desert. Pros and cons. Pros, it's oligarchic. There's no interaction among the urban centers in Mexico. Physical interconnections are very, very thin, so only a few families run everything and have since independence over a century and a half ago. Which means if you're an American and you're looking for a partner, all you have to do is go south, figure out who's in charge, knock on their door, introduce yourself. Two weeks later, you'll be leaving with a blistering hangover, a godchild, because you're part of the family now, and a fistful of signed contracts that you know you can rely upon because you now have a personal connection. Biggest downside of that, though, is once you've gobbled up the labor in that urban area, you're done. Mexicans are not mobile in the way that Americans are. They don't move within their country very much to take jobs because the infrastructure doesn't support it. And the cities stop, and then you just have desert. There's no intermingling at the edges. And the Texans have been working on this for 40 years, and they have already gobbled up probably 80% of the labor that was available. Which means, if we're going to rely on the Mexicans to do what we need to do, and oh my god, we need to rely on the Mexicans to do what we need to do, the northern section of the country is not the solution. It's got to be the center. The problem is that the infrastructure isn't there to support it. There are only three, yeah, I'll point, the three black lines, those are the only three intermodal freight facilities within the entire country. They don't interconnect. They just go south on a specific corridor and they don't really branch off. And if the northern Mexicans have already been metabolized, we have to make it all the way down to Mexico City. That's a thousand miles away. Which means we need to invest at least a trillion dollars in Mexican infrastructure in order to reach at scale the 50, 60 million people who live in the center of the country. And we have to do so in a way that doesn't make the Mexicans think that we're trying to take over, which is kind of what we're trying to do. This is going to be touchy, but if we don't pull it off, we will not have the labor to do what we need to do. Because if we still want stuff in a post-China world, we need help to build it. We need a differentiated labor market. And the Mexicans are the only ones within arm's reach that can help with that. There are other players that are further abroad, but we can't integrate with them the same way we can integrate with a neighbor. The Southeast Asian countries look pretty good to me. Thailand is the fastest aging one, but it still has at least another 25 years. The Indonesians and the Vietnamese are great. In fact, the, the Vietnamese are kind of scary. They've expanded their higher educational system with technical skills in mind. 40% of college grads in Vietnam are STEM graduates. They are attempting, and it looks like they're gonna pull it off, to leapfrog over China from a technological point of view, and they will probably achieve that within the next three or four years. There's also a geography situation that is very helpful. On the left, you're looking at a, a vegetation map, basically, and the green is tropics. And when you think about building infrastructure in tropics, in mountains, on peninsulas, on islands, it's an expensive, ugly business, because you really can't get economies of scale. 
But there's pros and cons to that too. The con is that these countries have never gone to war with one another like they have in, say, Europe or Northeast Asia. There's not a lot of bad blood. And that means that almost everyone started out in tropical agriculture. And if there's one thing that everyone in tropical agriculture can agree on is it's that no one wants to be in tropical agriculture. In temperate zone agriculture, there's a, there's a value chain. You, can, you don't have to do it all by hand. You can get a tractor, you can get a combine, you can get a spreader. In the tropics, no, 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 tropical fruits, harvested by hand, tended to by hand, transported by hand. You can't have a combine harvesting mangoes. It's all unskilled labor. And so whenever people in tropical ag have a chance, they move out and they go to the cities. And that means population density. Their cities are wildly overpopulated for the skill set of the labor. And that means this is the most competitive part of the world for value-added manufacturing. This is where we're going to see a big footprint expand. Already has, and you're talking about a billion people. There are already more people in coastal Southeast Asia than there are in coastal China. They're probably the biggest winners in the world after Mexico. But it will look different. Population density again. You'll notice that there aren't threads. When you look at a more normal population structure in an industrialized or industrializing country, you get your urban hub, and you've got threads of highways that are densely settled going out to the next population center. And that allows for what we consider to be multi-step supply chains, because there's multiple population centers linked together tightly. You can move things back and forth through the system. That doesn't happen in Mexico. It's desert. It's mountainous. It's jungle. Combination thereof. And so each urban core will be good, very good at one or two things. And that's it, because they don't have access to a complementary system. So what we do in the United States is we might make the frame, we send it across, they put in the spark plugs, they send it back, we put in the computer system, we send it back, they put in the seats. And it's going to different cities each time. And it's that back and forth that makes it work. But they can't do that at scale within their own system. They have to have that partner. The Vietnamese do not. It's a much more traditional system from our point of view. And so the Vietnamese can do top to bottom manufacturing. The only thing they have to worry about are the components that they can't make themselves, which are substantial. But you can have Vietnam as almost a one-stop shop for most of what we need. We just can kind of add the dusting of the tech that's necessary to make it work. It's cheaper to do. Unfortunately, it's 7,000 miles further away, so we can't do the back and forth. Two different models. All right, let's talk products. Uh, if you're at the uh, top of this, you don't know who your third tier suppliers are, much less your 13th. If you're at the bottom, you can probably fit your entire supply chain on the back of a cocktail napkin after throwing back a few bourbons. If you're on the left, or excuse me, on the right, uh, you're already within the NAFTA system. If you're on the right, you're dependent on the Chinese. A couple examples. Energy. American energy is made with American capital. It's on American pipelines, American workers going to American refineries, ending up with an American consumer. And that is not simple at all. 1,400 supply chain steps for the iPhone, 91% of which involve mainland China in some fashion. The new iPhone just came out a couple weeks ago. You might want to buy two. We're probably getting close to the point where this is the last one. Here's everybody else. I'm going to pull out a few of these. Uh, automotive. Courtesy of NAFTA 2. Over 90% of the supply chains for autos sold in North America are manufactured in North America. Don't mean to suggest we're not going to have some hiccups, but the core of it has already worked and the rest is just network effects. That's not bad. In terms of foreign investors, the Europeans are of the belief that they can bring in all the parts and just assemble it here. That's not going to work very well. The Asians have figured out that they need to actually do the manufacturing here. So they're probably north of 70% manufactured within North America, where most European companies are less than 10 Heavy vehicles are going to be a problem, though. When you have globalization, it's very common for countries to put their thumbs on the scale to encourage parts of the industrial plant to be in their countries, especially if it's something they can technologically do without a lot of help. As big as they are, a forklift is actually simpler 
than a passenger car in terms of the equipment and the construction. And since not everybody needs a forklift, it's not like you're going to have these facilities everywhere. So the Chinese really have dominated that space. So forklifts, dump trucks, construction equipment, agricultural equipment, we're going to have a real problem when the Chinese go away. But it is a relatively easy fix because anyone who can do automotive at scale can also do heavy equipment at scale. It's just a question of the numbers being right. And nothing like half of the stuff vanishing from the world is going to make the numbers right. That's where I'm worried the most. A successful electronics and computing sector requires a lot of different labor price points. Because the person who does the plastic molding is not the person who does the die cast, or pulls the wire, or builds the chip, or does the software, or polishes the lenses. That's a different step with a different skill set at a different price point. And one of the many reasons that the East Asians are so good at this is you've got 11 different labor sets within one extended market. And they can all specialize at what they do best. We don't have that in North America. We have two price points, us, Mexico, that's it. And so we have to change how this is all done. The textiles example gives me hope that we can, but I have no idea in hell how because we haven't had to figure it out yet. But we're going to have to real soon. And we're probably going to have to do it without northern Mexico, because that's already spoken for. All right, here's where things get a little messy. Not all semiconductors are made equal. We all hear about the CHIPS Act and what the Biden administration wants to do. That's for a very, very specific kind of chip. 10 nanometer and smaller, the most advanced one in the world. Now, today, 92% of those come from Taiwan, 8% from South Korea. If every facility that is under construction in the United States because of the CHIPS Act ultimately comes to fruition, we will be making less than 5% of the global total. It's a start, it's not huge. The Koreans and the Taiwanese have been working on this for a long time. Here's the problem. The Taiwanese manufacture most of them. They fabricate most of them. But most of the technology that allows them to do so is not Taiwanese. They just have the end production. There's a coalition of over 9,000 companies worldwide, half of which only produce one product for one customer that ends up in a Taiwanese facility. You pull any of those out of the constellation, the whole thing stops until you repair the constellation. We're going to have to rebuild an entire environment in order to continue putting these chips together. That's going to take a decade. All it takes is one country falling out. I'm personally most concerned about the Germans on this one. Now, on the other extreme, you've got the dumb chips, the 90 nanometer and bigger. This is your Internet of Things, your, your smart blender, the shower brush that sings to you, your smart lights. 80% of those are made by the Chinese, and they can do that without outside help. The other 20% is kind of a split between Japan and the United States. Now, if the Chinese were to vanish tomorrow, obviously the Internet of Things would just die. I would argue that's not that big of a deal. And we have the technology, we have the knowledge. We don't have to reinvent anything. We just need a couple years to build low-end fab facilities. The Mexicans are very interested in getting into that space. The problem that they face is bilingual technical language skills. If, you ever if you've got kids who are looking for a way to make a lot of money really quick, tell them to learn how to assemble chips and to do it in Spanish and go down there and be translators because that is going to be the single biggest friction point in the bilateral relationship for the next decade or two. And then everything in the middle, 10 to 90, that's your car. That's your planes. That's most power management systems. That's smart meters. We're probably okay there because those are made in Germany and Italy and here in Japan and Korea, Taiwan, even a little bit in China with imported gear. That looks okay. It's the high end I'm really worried about because those high end chips, that's AI. All these server farms are getting built to do AI at scale. No, we're not going to have the chips for it. That's the iPhone. We're not going to have the chips for them. That's electric vehicles. 
Electric vehicles have two to three grand worth of chips, and they're all either the very high end or the very low end. We won't be able to sustain it and everything that comes from it. Now, for you guys' world more uh, specifically, here's your lives. Yeah, there's no way to fix that fast. Order from everyone. Find a way. Counting on half of them not making it. That's the biggest sticking point you guys have by far. This doesn't look that great either. This is space that the Chinese dominate utterly. And replacing that at scale is not a two-year program. It's not just the manufacturer. The assembly requires a lot of fingers and eyes and a lot of quality control. And there is no other country in the world that can step into that space quickly. So we're talking about a significant build out that's not just capital intensive, but is very labor intensive. And it is not clear where, if, that can happen with today's technology. This stuff we kind of do in our sleep. OK, the stuff in the middle. I'm oh, sorry, no, let me. Uh, this is the stuff we do in our sleep. The United States is a weird economy in that we're very, very high end and very, very low end at the same time. We have a lot of elbow room, we have a lot of forest, we have a lot of wood, and courtesy of the shale industry, we have a lot of things that are energy intensive that we're the world's most competitive. None of that's in danger. And this is the stuff that the Mexicans are gonna be helping us with. The slower China breaks down, the more time we have to build the industrial plant that we need to give you guys the guts of what you need. But that means working with the Mexicans as forward looking as possible to build the stuff out so we don't start the day that stuff from China just vanishes. Oops. Here we go. My biggest concern about China is the information block in there has now become so intense that we just can't get information at all. And we might not find out that the government has collapsed until the stuff just stops arriving. We're not going to have a lot of warning. All right, I showed you guys this last year, population density map on this side, uh, economic map on this side. The areas that are populated are also the areas that are economically viable. It's a pure weather thing. Russia has weather. People live where it's less. <laughs> the Russian strategy is pretty straightforward. Expand out of the weather or the area that's decent until you hit a series of geographic barriers that you can't shove tanks through and then forward position your military in the access points between them. Ukraine is in the unfortunate position of not controlling those access points, but it's on the way to one in Romania and one in Poland. So whenever the Russians are done with Ukraine, if they can win, they will move on to the next line of countries, five of which are in NATO. American Western foreign policy is very simple. Prevent them from having that opportunity. Now, here we have the Ukrainian demographic structure. After independence in 1992, over a third of the population either left or died. Some of the lowest birth rates we've ever seen. Another third of the population since the war has fled as refugees, mostly women and children. So this is pre-war data. We're very close to the point in Ukraine where they will not have the population density that is required to maintain industrial level infrastructure. So whether it is food or steel or coal or stuff transiting, Ukraine is not going to survive the next 30 years, even if they win the war. There's another problem in that space. This is, um, hang on, my hair's falling apart here. This is the Russian permafrost. It's a geological phenomenon. You go 10 to 30 feet down and you hit a layer where it never melts. But the top chunk melts in the summer and turns into a bog. It is the most difficult environment in the world for mineral extraction. So the Russians have the most, expense, most expensive upfront cost to bring stuff online. You basically have to wait for it to freeze solid. You run a berm out to your production site. You run a rail line or a pipe or a road along that berm and then you have a a pad that you drill from when it's frozen, because you can't drill through mud. It's a very dynamic landscape, because if an aquifer cracks open, everything just kind of slides and follows the aquifer. Or maybe it drains down, in which case you just get a, a sinkhole pit that opens. Or maybe there's no aquifer, and you just get a warm summer. 
and the vegetation that's been frozen for eons starts to thaw, starts to decompose. Decomposing vegetable matter gives off methane, and the whole land buckles, which means that the Russians have the highest maintenance costs for any mineral production in the world. Here's the problem. Russian population structure. Now, about the time that people who were 15 were getting born, 2004, 2005, that's when the Russians stopped collecting data and just started making it up. So you've got that big gouge in the 20-somethings, post-Cold War birth rate collapse, and then you have fabricated data. There probably are only half as many children as this data would suggest. The Russian educational system collapsed back in 1985. So we had a collapse in the birth rate, a collapse of the educational system, which means that the youngest people in Russia who actually have technical skills at scale, they turned 62 this year. The year before the Russians started fabricating data, the life expectancy for the average Russian male was 67. They already had the worst skilled labor pool relative to their population and their needs in the world. And they're very close from simply losing all of it. The maintenance on the Russian systems, the development on the Russian systems, hasn't been done by the Russians for the most part. It's been done by BP or ExxonMobil, and especially the Dutch and the Germans. And all that went to zero when the war started. So whether it's sanctions, war damage, or simple lack of maintenance, we need to prepare for a world where everything that the world has become reliant upon from the Russians, palladium, platinum, oil, gas, even timber, just doesn't come anymore. There's another angle to it that's a little uglier. Now, this guy, uh, you can see where the ethnic Russian territories are in the, the top left. Uh, you've got Turkic minorities off to the east and the south. The problem is this is not an ethnic map. It's a population change map. The green zones are where population growth is happening roughly on pair with Florida and has for four decades. And the red zones are population losses roughly equivalent to Detroit and has been for four decades. Almost all the raw materials are produced in the green zones that are not controlled by ethnic Russians where they're experiencing population growth, but they're shipped through and processed in the red zones where the last bits of the skilled labor pool are that is in terminal decline. So you can add demographics to the reasons that we need to kiss the Russian stuff goodbye as well. Not to mention that this is going to be a very politically unstable region in the not too distant future because of the mismatch. One of the many reasons that the Russians feel that the Ukraine war is necessary is if they can get to kind of that outer crustal defense that they used to have in the Soviet period, then they can focus their forces internally to police this demographic flip. They're fighting for time. If they can pull this off, they probably buy themselves another 50 years. If they fail, they're gone within 20. All right, let me take a big dump on green tech. We talked about this a little bit last time I saw you guys. I think I even showed you this graphic. I mean, oversimplifying here, but um, thermal power, internal combustion engines, not all that complicated. You light a match, you start a fire, you capture the heat in some way. Can't do that with an EV system, can't do that with green tech. The process of producing the energy, transmitting the energy, storing the energy, requires an order of magnitude more materials and different materials. We're looking here at an EV versus an ICE vehicle. You can just see at a glance. And then here's the same kind of idea, but for generation, with solar and wind at the top, conventional thermal at the bottom. We need three times as much copper by 2030. We need 20 times as much lithium. We need 10 times as much nickel. There isn't enough on the planet to pull that off. And the Russians are a top three producer of these things. So they just, it, it can't happen. It's not physically possible with today's technology for the world. There is one way it might be possible for us. This is where all the stuff comes from that is not what we would consider to be part of our friends and family network. If we use our military, which is done with the war on terror, which is recruited and rested and rearmed, and we go and conquer all of these places, 
and we run a Belgian imperial style extraction empire and bring all of it home, then we can do the green transition, but no one else. Now, this is not a recommendation. I'm just saying that the path we're on, this is the only way that it works. And even that would not be enough because you still have to turn it into processed material. Lithium ore is useless. You have to turn it into lithium metal. The red bars are the stuff that, where that processing happens in either China or Russia. And even that's not enough. You have to talk about finance. Here you're looking at the full cycle cost for a natural gas combined cycle plant. The blue is the construction, the siting, the building. The gray is the fuel, full life cycle. This is a model you're familiar with. This is what you all do. The idea is it's a subscription model. You pay as you go. That doesn't work for green tech. For green tech, it's almost all up front. This is wind. Capital costs have tripled. They will triple again. I think most of the plans that were put out there four years ago assumed that there would never be a 100 basis point increase in capital costs. We've now gone up by 500. We have another 500 to go. The market can't support this. The IRA will help maybe sand down some edges. But we're going to have to do something that in the United States we really don't like doing. We're going to have to choose what we want to focus on. The smart play would be to put it solar panels where it's sunny, not in Massachusetts. Put wind turbines where it's windy, not in Florida. And wire the power to where we actually live. But we're not going to do that. that that's the smart thing. <laughs> All right, another matrix. If you're at the top, you want the government out of your personal life. If you're at the bottom, you think the government should regulate social norms in some way. If you're on the right, you want the government out of your wallet. And if you're on your left, you think the government should intervene in people's wallets to get the resources it needs to remake society in some way. And you can kind of combine these things. So if you're at uh, the bottom right, an economic and a social conservative, uh, you're kind of opposed to food stamps on principle because famine builds character. And if you're at the, <laughs> if you're at the top left, a social liberal and an economic conservative, you want to bring all of the bureaucrats in Washington together for a big party where you'll serve arsenic cake. Here are our political factions. The single biggest effect that Donald Trump had is he elevated a faction to prominence that really hadn't voted before. Most of the people who voted for him the first time he ran for president hadn't voted in the previous four presidential elections. A lot of different estimates for how many people that is, but all of them are north of 10 million voters. They are now not simply the single largest voting bloc in the country. They've taken over the Republican Party. Because in calling to these people, Trump ended up picking fights with what he would call the rhinos. People who are, were the traditional leaders, of the, the, the traditional leaders of the policy. He ejected them from his White House. He ran, he campaigned against their candidates in Congress, and he completely purged them from the Republican national conventions. They're not even present in the decision-making apparatus of the party now. And in effect, They've become swing voters. But he was able to attract other factions that were closer to his social conservative core supporters. And a lot of people have switched sides. This is the MAGA coalition. This is the Republican Party of today. This has lots of consequences. Let's focus on three. First, the unions are swing voters. That hasn't happened in a century and a half. We're entering a period where we need to double the size of the industrial plant. How many of those jobs do you think are blue collar? We have a labor shortage, and we will for at least another decade, probably two. We're going to see the greatest increase in union activity and union power in the history of the republic in the next 10 to 20 years. The business community are swing voters now. That hasn't happened in the last 150 years. And this is crazy because, you know, the unions versus business, that tug of war, that is modern economics. Their discussions, their debates, their compromises, their negotiations, that is our economic policy for five generations. And these people are right now not even in the room. Part of the reason why economic policy out of both the Obama and the Trump administration just seems so nuts 
It was because there's no one in either administration that can do math. In fact, on both sides, they're kind of offended by the concept that you need to be able to do math to run an economy. The group that most fancies themselves economists in the Biden administration today are the Greens. Until such time as the unions or the business or both end up in one coalition or the other, economic policy making, decisions, choices about where we need to focus are going to be completely divorced from reality. And this is going to last bare minimum for another presidential cycle. Now, we will get through this. The idea that the two economically most capable, competent, and numerous voting blocks on these topics are going to remain outside the political system, that's silly. But it's going to take time for us to figure out where they're going to land. And the political coalitions are going to look very, very different on the other side. So best of luck. Because not only will you not be getting good guidance or regulation, there isn't a logic to it. And that's just the environment you're operating in at a time when you're going to have to at least double the grid. No pressure. We get a lot of associated natural gas production that comes from our shale oil operations, which, you know, technically, uh, based on how you're running the numbers, that could be free. Uh, anyway, it means the United States is the world's largest producer of natural gas, kicking out about 120 billion cubic feet per day, or 1,200 billion cubic meters per year. And most of that is trapped in the system at home, because moving natural gas from A to B is kind of difficult. There's really only two routes. One is to have a pipeline network that sends it from production to consumption locations. Usually those are within individual country because natural gas, being a gas is hard to store. And the U.S. does have the world's largest system for distribution uh, by far. And where the second option is to chill it down to negative 300 odd degrees uh, into liquid form and then put it onto a specialty tanker to send it across the ocean to someone who has a specific receiving facility who can take the liquid and regasify it without it blowing up. Um, all of that is as expensive as it sounds. So what happened in 2022 in Europe was the Europeans used to be on a piped system that brought in stuff from northwestern Siberia for the most part, and that gave them access to reliably large and reliably cheap supplies. So when the Europeans decided to move on from the Russians, they had to go to a, some other piped suppliers that they have, uh, specifically Algeria, Libya, and especially Norway, but that wasn't enough. So they had to go out and tap the world for liquefied natural gas, which is not available in large volumes in the way that piped gas from a neighbor can be. And so prices went up and up and up and up. And in the United States, we sent everything that we could. Uh, and that allowed the Europeans a degree of energy security, but only at a very, very high price point. Uh, what we're seeing now is the slow motion, so far slow motion, degradation of the Russian system. Because their pipes are all oriented towards Europe, and they are falling into disrepair because they're not being used. And the Russians are using all their technical experts to maintain their war effort. Uh, they do have a couple of liquefied natural gas facilities, some in the far east on the island of Sakhalin, north of Japan and some on the Yamal Peninsula in far northwest Russia. But it is foreigners who provide the technical skills for those facilities to operate. And as those technical skills are increasingly withheld, these facilities will fall into disrepair. And, um, well, let's just say when you've got a refrigeration unit that is dealing with billions of cubic of meters of uh, flammable materials and something goes wrong, something goes wrong all at once. We haven't had any industrial accidents at these facilities yet but it's only a matter of time, one year, two year, five years, I don't know how long, before those facilities go offline and then Russian natural gas will be gone. Uh, getting it out by other means is nearly impossible. There are very few countries that can do LNG liquefaction. China is not on that list. Most of them are part of the Western Alliance plus Japan that is backing Ukraine. And if you're going to send a pipeline from the Imperial Peninsula to populated China, you're talking about the world's largest chunk of infrastructure with roughly 70% of the train it's going to cross being virgin with no existing infrastructure at all. So you're talking tundra and tegai and permafrost and mountains. Um, building that pipeline would be a $100 billion project. It would take a minimum of 15 years, 
And even if it was done, uh, the cost of operating it would be two, three, four times as much as the natural gas would be worth. So the Russians and the Chinese have repeatedly said that this pipeline is going to happen. They've been saying that for 20 years. And then you get down into the details and the Chinese are like, yeah, and the Russians are going to pay for the operation of the pipeline. And the Russians are like, yeah, the Chinese are going to pay for the operation of the pipeline. And that's why nothing has started. So the world has to get by without Russian natural gas. And until a year and a half ago, they were the world's largest exporter. Uh, that is going to have big price implications everywhere except in countries that produce natural gas for themselves. Uh, read the United States. Now, that means in the United States, the 2 to $3 range we're in right now is more or less normal. We're not going to go above 5 for any more than very short periods of time because what we've discovered is that the shale gas guys can bring on well, wells in a matter of weeks. If you remember your shale history back between 2004 and 2011, roughly, it was all about the natural gas. And then in 2011 to 2013, uh, oil really came into its own. And natural gas faded, not because we weren't producing it, but because we were producing it as a byproduct of oil production. What we saw in calendar year 2023 when prices were going up is that the shale guys went back to the old natural gas fields and were able to produce using the tricks they'd learned in the shale oil field in the last 10 years. And that pushed down the cost of production and pushed up the volume of natural gas that was produced by massive volumes. And we basically got back to a balanced market. Now, the United States does have takeaway capacity to get some of that natural gas to international systems. We have roughly 10 billion cubic feet of pipeline capacity, mostly in Mexico, and about another 10 billion cubic feet for LNG, which is mostly going to Europe now. Uh, that's in comparison to 120 billion cubic feet of overall production, which is a number we now know that we can increase in fairly quick succession when we need to. So again, prices should be lower for longer. We might have those occasional spikes, but then the shale guys will just drill and bring the price right back down. Now, why does that matter to you? Three big reasons. Number one, natural gas remains the number one fuel source for electricity generation in this country, about 40% of the total. So anything that requires electricity, which is almost everything, uh, natural gas is the, the solution, at least in the midterm. And since the United States needs to roughly double the size of its industrial plant, as the Chinese fade away, we basically need 50% more electricity. Natural gas is going to be a huge component of that. Second, Let's say you don't like fossil fuels at all. Let's say that you're a greenie and you like solar and wind. Well, you should still like natural gas because when the wind doesn't blow or when the sun doesn't shine, which happens, you know, every night, you need a partner of fuel in order to keep the lights on. And natural gas combined cycle power generation facilities can spin up and spin down in less than 15 minutes. So they are the best um, partner for green tech that we have. And while the Californians don't like to say it out loud, about half of their energy that they generate within California itself comes from natural gas, specifically because of this pairing capacity. Uh, batteries cost an order of magnitude more. They don't last very long, uh, and they have some other problems with their construction that is ugly from any number of strategic and green points of view. Natural gas is a known. And as long as we're going to be moving towards wind and solar for most of this country, uh, even in increments, natural gas is the logical partner for all of it. And then the third thing is a little bit more esoteric, and that has to do with what happens in manufacturing once you decide you want to really get into everything. In globalization, we have broken up the supply chains. Energy comes from someplace, iron ore comes from someplace, steel comes from someplace else, plastics comes from someplace else. It's brought together for assembly at different locations. As the world breaks apart and we have a more national or continental system, more and more of those intermediate steps need to be done at home or near home. And a lot of those intermediate steps use raw materials that are made from natural gas. So natural gas makes naphtha, makes polyurethane, makes plastics. Naphtha makes fertilizers and pesticides, makes agricultural products. Uh, natural gas is the base material for a lot of this stuff. And now the United States is the largest producer supplier and exporter of all of those intermediate products. And what we're doing seeing now is the U.S. moving up the production chain, moving in a greater value-added production system for all of this so that we can still do the classic manufacturing and have the entire input system at home. So 